Good morning, I'm Elliot Forrest. Welcome to the Green Space in Lower Manhattan. I'm Elliot Forrest from WQXR, and we are here for a very special performance from violinist Daniel Hope. Gramophone Magazine has said this about our guest today. There are few figures in today's classical music who so perfectly embody the role of ambassador for music as Daniel Hope. Uh, he has many titles in addition to violin soloist, uh, with the world's leading orchestras and conductors. He's a published author and a radio and television host. He could take my job, but I don't think I can take his. You may be familiar with his Hope at Home series that he streamed live from his living room in Berlin during the COVID lockdown. He produced 150 episodes in the series, raising money for artists in need. He stopped by today to give us a concert, talk about his life and his work, and he's joined by pianist Maxime Lando, who is the recipient of the prestigious Gilmore Young Artist Award. Uh, Lando has a very busy performance career. In the next few months, he'll be in South Carolina and Poland and Canada. We're going to start with a little music. Here's a movement from Antonin Dvorak's Sonotina. Daniel Hope from WQXR.
beautiful second movement from Dvorak Sonatina performed live here in Lower Manhattan in our green space with violinist Daniel Hope and pianist Maxime Lando. That was beautiful. Thank you very much indeed and wonderful to be here. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Thank you for joining us. I know you're uh, in uh, not the middle but the beginning of a concert tour and uh, you're in a lot of places, so we appreciate you stopping by. Yes, I'm on tour with the Zurich Chamber Orchestra, a fantastic ensemble. We're doing 10 concerts here in the States. Tonight we're in New Brunswick at the State Theater, and it's just a joy to be back in America and to bring these wonderful musicians from Europe. Uh, just a little bit more about the piece we heard written, I think, in, in America, right? In New York City, 1893. Yeah, yeah um, what were the circumstances of the Sonatina, do you know? Dvorak was asked to come here to take over, or help to create a music academy and to helped to form American music, which was no small task for European. And this is his Opus 100. And typical for Dvorak, he didn't give his Opus 100 something kind of a big pompous introduction. He dedicated it to his kids. And this is the sights and sounds of America through European eyes. It's a gorgeous piece. And that particular movement, he gathered uh, all sorts of souvenirs from traveling around America, rural America. He went to Iowa, Spillville where all the Czech immigrants were, and he gathered the sights and sounds and brought them together into this little piece. And, and the New World Symphony, and the, there's nothing more American than this Czech composer for some reason, right? Well, the question is, what is American? And that's something that fascinates me. You know, I, I love American music, and Dvorak was in fact one of the first persons to say that American music, uh, the key to American music is in the African-American melodies. And that was at the time, 1893, an amazing, thing for him to say. It went around the world, it caused a huge stir, and uh, he believed truly in it. Let's talk more about the Zurich Chamber Orchestra. How, how large an ensemble is that? Uh, we are about 25 at the moment on tour. We go up to about 30. It's a string orchestra with full winds. On this tour, we're only on strings, and we're doing two different programs, or two and a half programs. And I've been music director since 2016. But I've also known this orchestra since I was a little boy, because it was the orchestra that Yehudi Menuhin um, had as his resident orchestra in the festival in Gstaad, and I was very lucky to grow up very close to Yehudi Menuhin, and therefore the first orchestra I ever heard was the Zurich Chamber, and so to think 40-some years later that I'd be leading this orchestra is a huge privilege for me. So what were the circumstances of you knowing Yehudi Menuhin? I was born in South Africa. Um, we had to leave the country. My father's a writer and journalist, and he was fiercely anti-apartheid. We were kicked out of the country. We ended up in England without any money and without any passports. And it was very precarious for us. We weren't allowed to stay there. And um, we had to find some kind of um, status or employment. My mother went out to get a job, and she was a secretary. And she happened to be offered uh, the job as a secretary to the Archbishop of Canterbury and to <laughs> Yehudi Menuhin. And fortunately, she went for Yehudi Menuhin. Wow. <laughs> w was that the reason you picked the fiddle? It's certainly the reason that I was surrounded by music from my earliest age, you know. Um, he took us in. As I said, we were penniless and um, non-musical. I was a baby, and the first experiences I had were these extraordinary musicians that came to his house, and that's where my mom worked. And then he took us with him on tour. We went to Switzerland and it immersed us in music. So when I said at the age of four, I want to play the fiddle, it wasn't that much of a surprise. And is there one thing he either said or something that you saw that, that either sparked you to either want to do it or that you've held on to a, a, as a player as something that, that, you, that you use? Well, there's so much. He was so open in, in terms of music. He didn't believe in the categorization. And until I was about 10, I didn't realize there were different types of music, <laughs> you know, because for him, a given day would include Ravi Shankar, Stefan Grappelli, and Rostopovich. He didn't make that distinction. And so until I was literally 10 or 11, I was studying the violin, and people said, no, no, you're a classical violinist. I didn't really know what that meant. Um, plus, he was insistent that we learn to improvise. That was something he didn't learn. And my very first violin teacher, Shelia Nelson, she taught us at the age of four to improvise. And for that, I'm internally grateful. Uh, getting back to the Zurich Chamber Orchestra, uh, you conduct as well. I direct from the violin. Um, You're I making leave, a distinction. I leave conducting for, for those that know better. So what's the difference? <laughs> well, it's basically um, one leads as, as if one were the concert master, but you are actually leading the ensemble. So we do symphonies with me leading from the first chair, or I do concertos where, of course, the ensemble would then accompany me. But it's a team spirit, and it's such an incredible ensemble. Um, it's a real privilege to make music. We've recorded a lot together. We tour. We do about 80 concerts around the world together, and it's our third U.S. tour. 
and especially at this time coming out of the pandemic, it's not You're so ready easy. to go. We just we're very grateful to be here and making music again. And the administrative part of that is, uh, uh, do, you, do you like that part uh, in, in running an orchestra? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's of course it, it goes with the territory, um, and I think you have to really throw yourself into it. I'm fortunate to have a fantastic team that supports me and backs that all up because I couldn't do the projects that I do without a great number of people who work extremely hard. But you know, the music making is what's the most important thing for me, and because of the team, I'm I'm allowed to do that. Uh, and the Hope at Home, uh, give us a little bit more about what that, how that started and what that was like for you. Well, it was extraordinary for me. Just a few days into the first lockdown, I had a call from Arte, which is the French-German TV uh, public broadcaster in, in Europe. And um, the head of the German part is, is a close friend of mine. And he said, you know, would you like to, to do concerts from, from home? And I had not thought about doing this. I'd seen people doing things. I'd seen com things coming out of QXR and all, yeah. all sorts of people were doing wonderful things. And I said, look, you know, if I'm going to do this, it has to sound like it's going to be in a concert hall. I didn't want to have a cell phone filming. I wanted something else. And he said, I'm not sure that we can do that, you know, at this, at this short stage. I said, well, I know the people that can do it. Let's try. And we made a deal that they would accept that structure if we went online the next night the very next night which we did we launched it live and thinking we might do five or six episodes and nobody dreamed that we do 150 we had 400 artists you know every single one of those artists that came received a, a fee yeah. it was important for us that we try to keep music alive um, especially freelance artists who really suffered dramatically you know during the time and basically, during the first 50 shows, anybody who was in Berlin who could get out of their house, you know, we, we got to come over. So you had very famous artists like Simon Rattle or Christian Thielemann. You had young artists coming in. You had jazz artists. You had singers, songwriters. And a whole community really emerged. And, um, you know, 150 shows later, I still look back and say, did we really do that? <laughs> <laughs> the uh, I, one guest you had, from what I understand, the very first person I ever interviewed on this very stage in the green space was Sting. Oh, yeah. And his wife, Trudy. And, and he came to be a part of your thing, right? He came, in fact, now just at Christmas time. We, we, we essentially finished Hope at Home because, you know, it was a lockdown right. idea. But we did a Christmas special um, last Christmas, and Sting came and um, sang some songs, and he was he was in my living room. It was amazing. I mean, he's just he's one of the, the artists that that I admire the most. I've known him since I was, in fact, a, a small child. Funnily enough, he bought Yehudi Menuhin's house in London, <laughs> the house in which I grew up. Wow! So small that kind world. of connects us. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, I've, I've recorded and played with him, but to actually have him right there in the living room, right. you know, we had to keep pinching ourselves. It surprises people people because he had a Robert Schumann project is what we talked about. Yes, so he, wonderful you know, project. He, yeah, he, he's uh, quite versatile. And then Hope on the Road, what is that? Well, after the 150 shows, we, we gathered enough experience to, to, to look at making high-quality films about music. So we decided to start making feature-length documentaries uh, about music. So half of my heritage is Irish. So we went to Ireland and made a, an hour film, which was um, co-produced with, with PBS about Ireland, about my grandfather, my great grandfather, and about Irish music and teaching me Irish music by the best people who are there. We've just completed a film now about Hollywood and the Hollywood exile composers. That's the other side of my, of my heritage. Um, the German Jewish who escaped the Nazis and came to South Africa and to the United States. And so we traced that. Um, we interviewed members of the Schoenberg family, for example, um, his son, Ronald, and his um, daughter-in-law, and made a film about where the Hollywood sound came from. And next up next year will be South Africa. We're going to look at South African sound. That's, again, going back to the country of my birth. So it's traveling on the road. It's meeting people. It's learning about music and culture and producing high-quality films that tell a story. You're a melting pot all, all, all in yourself, it seems, that uh, the quite mix of the, the backgrounds. Uh, we play um, film music every day on WQXR. We call it the score at four. It's a, it's a genre that I love a great deal. And, um, and I, you know, I certainly think that the fact is, is that the majority of symphonic music being heard by people today is being heard in television and films. So there's so much great music and exploring Absolutely. that. Absolutely. And why they were uh, not welcome in the concert hall for so many years is certainly worth exploring. What were the composers you, you covered? We've covered, you know, everyone from Korngold to Miklos Rocha, 
Um, we've done Eric Seisel, Schoenberg himself, you know, there's Waxman, and there's a whole treasure trove of music that, that came out of Europe that really essentially became the European sound. And many of those emigre composers, they were phenomenal at adapting their talents. Uh, you know, someone like Korngold, who was a, a child genius, and Richard Strauss fell on his knees and said, this is going to be the greatest musician that you know, we've ever experienced since Mozart, and then comes out here with Max Reinhardt and is forced to stay, but, you know, but fortunately gets the opportunity to write for Robin Hood and decides, his father says, don't come back to Europe, stay where you are. He did Robin Hood, and Robin Hood essentially saved his life. So that, that facility to be able to do that with such talent, and it, you know, it it influenced generations of film composers. The great John Williams says, without Korngold, you know, we, we wouldn't be where we are. Right. And, you know, somebody as amazing as that, I think, also understands where it came from. And we're coming full circle to have uh, Dvorak be uh, a quintessential American composer and have some of these European composers come over and write films and define what the Western sound is. Yeah. Uh, not people born in this country at all. Um, uh, we've got uh, a piece we're going to hear a uh, music now by Schoenberg, right? Yeah, real rarity. It's a it's a student piece by him. It's a fragment, in fact. It goes back to his days in Vienna, where he was still working in a bank, and where he was trying to, to get off his feet and and was being told by Zemlinsky, "You have to keep doing what you're doing. You have to keep playing the cello, and you write little pieces to delight the company, to delight um, the salon." And this is this is a very very you know if you blink it's gone but it's a little <laughs> jewel, and then uh, you'll follow that by a piece by Fritz Kreisler. What are we going to hear? We're going to hear the Liebeslied, which is one of his most famous uh, pieces. Um, all pieces from the Belle Epoque, and Kreisler himself was a huge authority in Vienna, one of the w youngest students to be accepted at the age of twelve at the Conservatory in Vienna, and of course at the same time as Schoenberg was finding his feet. So two very different characters, both ended up in the U.S. Both had a huge impact on American culture, but in different ways. So we thought it would be nice to pair them together. All right. If you want to sure. get ready, uh, let's hear it. We're going to hear uh, two pieces, Arnold Schoenberg's Fragment and Fritz Kreisler's Liebeslide, violinist Daniel Hope, pianist Maxime Lando, live from the green space from WQXR. <laughs> Thank you. 
Fritz Kreisler's Liebeslide, and for that, a fragment by Arnold Schoenberg, Daniel Hope, Maxime Lando in the green space. Hold on to your fiddle for just one more second, yeah, well, if you would. Yeah, of course. Uh, just, um, uh, I'm always so curious about these because I, I know that there's always a wonderful history with most violins and who had it before. Tell us about yours. Yes, uh, this is the 1742 Guarneri del Gesù. Uh, it's known as the ex Lipinski, and Lipinski was one of the most famous violinists at the end of the 19th century, a Polish virtuoso, and in fact a rival of Paganini. And Paganini would used to go into various cities and would challenge the best violinist to come and duel against him on the stage. <laughs> and of course he always won, except once in Warsaw against Lipinski. And as a result, uh, the friendship ended pretty soon after that because <laughs> it went around the world that Paganini had been beaten. And when they asked Paganini, who is the greatest violinist in the world? He said, I don't know, but the second greatest is Lipinski. <laughs> um, and this instrument is a magnificent uh, Cremonese work of art, actually. I've been lucky enough to play it for about 12 years. It's, it's on loan to me. Yeah, how did it come um, your way? A, a, a benefactor bought it, in fact. Um, I was allowed to choose it and bought it and put it at my disposal. So it's uh, a huge honor to, to get to play it. And it's Lipinski himself played the Kreutzer Sonata with Franz Liszt uh, in Dresden. Um, we, in fact, found a photograph of Lipinski. It's one of the earliest photographs holding this instrument in Dresden. So uh, you can actually trace it back. Uh, he played with Chopin. He played the piano tree of Chopin with Chopin. Uh, and the Schumann Carnival is dedicated to Lipinski. So uh, it's kind of amazing to think of the history that this instrument has, has witnessed. And, 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 you know, I just don't even pe think people know about it. It probably never leaves your sight that, you know, what you have to do to sort of keep it around and just, you know, you leave the hall and everything. It's like yeah. part of you, right? It, well, it certainly is. You have to be just very careful. And uh, on the other hand, you know, it's been around for 300 years. It survived <laughs> wars and famine and <laughs> everything else. So it's, uh, you know, at the end, it's a tool, but it's an incredibly valuable and beautiful work of art at the same time. And I'm guessing you sort of feel that you're a steward for the time being. Exactly, exactly. I'm just, you know, lucky enough to get to play it. These instruments now have skyrocketed in price. I don't want to even ask. Um, yeah, no. I wouldn't tell you. Yeah, so. exactly. <laughs> uh, the answer is it's none of my business. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, in, it's impossible for 99% for of musicians to be able to afford these kind of instruments. But fortunately, there are wonderful benefactors out there. There are foundations. And they're just great investments because, you know, uh, with, with crypto and the stock market crashing the way it is, these things, they don't lose value. No, and it's beautiful. I wanted to ask you about the other documentary uh, about your Celtic background, about your Irish background. Uh, tell us about the, the documentary and, and what's in it. Well, my um, great-grandfather, Daniel, uh, after whom I'm named, Daniel McKenna, uh, came from Waterford. And uh, I'd never been to, to Waterford. And my father, who remembers his grandfather from growing up on a farm in South Africa, wanted to try and see if we could trace him. So we went back there to Waterford and we, we met the mayor of Waterford and they, can you believe it, they found the house where my great grandfather was born and raised, which is a very small house. He was, they were a very poor family. There was 12 people living in a, in a two bedroom house, a terraced house, and it still exists. And once we found that it existed, we thought let's, let's go to Ireland and let's make this about our return to Ireland, finding out where we come from and at the same time use it to learn about Irish music and culture. So I visited some of the greatest Irish musicians, Sean Smith, who's probably the, the best fiddle player in the world, Irish fiddle player. In fact, he's even won the, the title of world champion fiddle player. So he, he tried to teach me to play the Irish fiddle. Um, and we had Siobhan Armstrong, who's like the queen of the Irish harp. And uh, we w did a, a field trip, a road trip, taking in the sights and sounds of Ireland, and, and I fell in love with the, with the place, with the people, with the music, in fact, and it spurned all sorts of things, including a brand new project of Irish music, which we're gonna be playing around the world. We're coming, in fact, next year back to the United States. We're gonna be um, at St. Paul, um, at the Schubert Club, um, performing it, and it's really, people, I think, they enjoy hearing this music, and it's not just Irish folk music, it's also Irish Baroque music, it's the whole story of Ireland, and the story of Ireland is fascinating to me. Was there a moment where there you got emotional about all of this and connecting with your with your family? Incredibly, incredible. I mean, just to be there. And then what happened was we were looking for a, a place to shoot a particular scene. And 
the ideal place was in a private garden and we had to get into this garden so we just knocked on the door and we asked this family who were having their supper if we might come in with a film crew of 10 people and make, shoot this <laughs> scene and they were like sure come on in you know it's incredibly nice and we, we did this scene and I explained you know who we were my father was there and it took about two hours, two and a half hours for us to shoot the scene, and they were still sitting having their dinner by the time we left. And as we left, the lady went into the kitchen. She came out, and she'd baked a loaf of bread. And she gave it to my father, and she said, I, you're one of us, so I thought you might like to have oh. this. And my father, I mean, I've, we were just absolutely, I mean, we are you know, crying. It was amazing that this, someone we'd never met before, but she connected immediately. And this idea, you're one of us, that's never really happened to us before. And I've often felt that when I hear particularly folk music from different countries, whether it's Appalachian music or Irish music or even klezmer to a certain degree, that there's a real connection, that, that, the, that it seems like there's a similarities that, uh, in vastly different cultures of what, what can be considered folk music. Absolutely. And that's one of the greatest things, I think, is when you have the privilege to work with some of these people that I have done, you know, not just in, in um, Irish music, but in Indian music, in jazz, in... in bluegrass and all these things you have an instant connection you may come from different worlds and different spheres but we're all musicians we're all joined at the hip somehow and that connection is is so fantastically inspiring when you actually are open to it well it comes from that first part before you were 10 when you didn't think there was different kinds of music exactly. i still kind of don't think there is but I, you know I, yeah, we've yeah, been told I, otherwise i kind of agree with you uh you've written a couple of things uh, a couple of books a family memoir Yes, yeah. four, four books in total. In yeah. fact, um, unfortunately, not yet published in English. They were all written in German. I, I live in Germany, and German is, has become more or less my first language, which is also a little bit unusual. But um, I'm still looking for, for an English um, publisher for these books. But there's a family memoir. There's a story of the Hollywood exile composers, um, and also a guide to, to classical music. Um, you know, why is it worth coming to celebrate classical music? Because I always think it is. Why is it worth? Why tell me why it's worth it? Well, I just think it's it's the greatest pleasure and the greatest inspiration that you can have. And the idea was to create a book to tell people who've never been to the concert hall before what are they going to expect, and to you know take away some of these myths and open it up and share it. Classical music is about sharing, and I believe that passionately. Whether it's for kids, whether it's for people, I think music is a human right, and I think everyone has the right to enjoy music. And with classical music, as much as I love pop and rock, but classical music takes you to a different place. It takes you to a different place of inspiration. It opens the mind and the soul that, in my opinion, no other music can do, and uh, I'd like people to share that. We're gonna hear a couple of more pieces, uh, something from Lily Boulanger from her song cycle, Lights in the Sky. She was the sister of Nadia Boulanger, who, famous French composer and teacher, uh, but uh, uh, Lily died tragically very young, right? Incredibly young, one of the greatest talents, I think, of the 20th century. She was the first woman to, to, to win the Prix de Rome, the most prestigious European prize that so many great uh, composers won, and she hasn't left very much. You know, She was in her early 20s when she tragically died, but what she's left is absolutely magnificent. I would encourage everybody to go out and listen. Um, there's very little for violin, so we're going to play, in fact, a song which we've transcribed um, because the, the sounds and the, the perfume of the Belle Epoque, you know, of the Gilded Age, is so beautifully contained in her language. And you're going to follow that with a piece by Georges Enescu. What is it? Yeah, Georges Enescu, who's principally now known as the teacher of Yehudi Menuhin, but, you know, he's an incredible composer and pianist in his own right, and this is a piece from... 1903, the impromptu concertant, a kind of a, a spontaneous um, impromptu piece which speaks about that time. It's about what was happening in Paris where he was living and teaching. It's his, his love of Wagner, his love of Foray. It's kind of um, sweeping gestures, a hugely difficult piano part, which is no problem at all for Maxime Lando, <laughs> um, and it's just a gorgeous piece. All right, uh, let's do it. Uh, this is Lily Boulanger and Georges Enescu, violinist Daniel Hope, Maxime Lando, the pianist. We are live in the green space in lower Manhattan from WQXR. Thank you. 
A piece by Georges Inescu is the impromptu concertant. Before that, music of Lily Boulanger, played by violinist Daniel Hope with pianist Maxime Lando. How, how, did, how did you two meet? Well, about uh, six years ago, Maxime uh, was invited to Europe, to Munich, to a program that I support for young artists, where they bring in old guys like me and <laughs> put them together with young artists. And they selected this incredible program with Cesar Frank Sonata and Mendelssohn D minor trio and Beethoven Kakadu. It was a huge trio, huge concert. And I remember walking through the door, and I think he was 14 at the time. And I remember looking at this little chap, thinking, this is not going to work. And he sat down at the piano, and she just blew us all away. It was absolutely incredible. And since then, I said, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> um, and we've been playing together many times. He's come to Europe several times. We've played together. Uh, in the United States, New Century Chamber Orchestra, where I'm also the music director. He's come as a soloist. I followed his career. He's now a young man of, I think, ripe old age of 20. Uh, and he's just a fantastic musician colleague. Um, there's nothing he can't do on the piano. Uh, it's really quite extraordinary. Uh, I, I think the first time you were on QXR was from Carnegie Hall, right? It was, yeah. And that was several years ago. <laughs> right. And uh, to tell the audience the circumstance of that. Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, it was just an unforgettable experience. Um, the fantastic pianist Long Long, um, he uh, had a an hand injury um, for his left hand, um, was out of commission for maybe a year, a year and a half. Um, and the amount of concerts that, that he had to cancel for, um, for those year and a halfs were insane. Um, so he, uh, you know, he calls me up one day and he had a... Um, you know, kind of a crazy idea uh, to take Rhapsody in Blue, um, you know, G George Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue piece that is so iconic and that everybody knows, um, and to turn it into a three-handed version um, where I'd be doing two hands and he'd be doing um, the right hand, and we would, you know, interwine hands and we would, you know, link arms and, and kind of go all over the place. Um, and it was, uh, you know, a phenomenal experience, uh, but the place that, that completely blew us away was doing it at Carnegie um, with the Philadelphia Symphony and with uh, Yannick. Um, and we also had uh, the incredible legend uh, Chick Corea join us on a separate piano. Um, and I, I mean, it, it was life changing for a number of reasons. Um, but f uh, one of the main reasons for me was uh, this entire um, mentorship and friendship that I began with Chick um, afterwards. And uh, much like how Daniel was talking about um, his uh, mentorship and his uh, experiences with Yehudi Menuhin, um, that's how I felt with, with Chick Corea. Um, it was toward the, the later part of his life, and I mean, it was just insane. You know, it was, I, I would be calling him on the phone every other day, and I couldn't believe it. And we'd be talking about, you know, everyday, ordinary things. I'd just be saying to myself, oh my God, I'm talking to, you know, Chick Corea. It's Chick Corea. <laughs> this is Chick Corea. <laughs> and I'm it's a, <laughs> another example of a great artist who crosses over into exactly. all sorts of music is music. Exactly. And I actually had that same ideology that, that Daniel had um, growing up, that, you know, there's one kind of music, you know, that uh, I didn't really know anything outside of classical music. I never really dabbled into jazz. I'd never heard of a single pop group. Um, and Chick was the person who completely uh, unfolded that for me. Um, you know, he, he told me it's just the statement that music is music. You know, music doesn't need to have labels. There's no need to have separation. Um, you know, it's something that everybody can enjoy. And there's so much of it out there um, for everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for being here today. Thank you. Um, Daniel, you mentioned, um, uh, I think, a Ukrainian composer earlier. Tell us about uh, the composer and what you're doing with his music. Um, well, Silvestrov is um, perhaps one of the best known uh, Ukrainian composers, and it's uh, somebody whose music that I've played for, for many years. I've been closely connected to Ukraine for about seven years. I was playing every year in Odessa, thanks to a close friend of mine, Alexei Botvinov, who founded a festival there. And we were supposed to be in Kiev, in fact, last February to record with Silvestrov when, of course, the war came. So we weren't able to do that, but instead we decided to record his music outside um, and he himself escaped from Ukraine by foot aged 84 and half blind across the border and we put on a concert in Berlin in the uh, Memorial Church one of the most famous venues it's the uh, church that's bombed in Berlin you might know it, it you, you have to, it's just a uh, kind of a remnant of a church and we put on this concert a fundraising concert back in the beginning of March and he came to the concert he just literally had arrived in Berlin and held this extraordinary speech. We were playing his music, and then he went and sat down at the piano, and he said, uh, you know, wh while I was escaping, I, I had this vision in my head of this music, 
and I'm going to play it for you now. And he went and he sat down. And everybody was expecting, you know, something incredibly dark and, and terrible and terrifying. And what came out was beauty and total serenity and beauty. And it was a very moving moment. Um, so ever since then, we've been doing a lot of his music around the world. Uh, we've recorded an album of his and helping Ukrainian artists to try and get footing, um, you know, to get funding, to, to live somewhere, to get tuition, doing what we can, really. And you have another on ensemble in San Francisco. Tell us about that. New Century Chamber Orchestra. I'm the music director of that uh, uh, ensemble. Do wonderful you sleep, ensemble. by the way? I do, yes. Okay, just, <laughs> just checking. Uh, that's a, a fantastic ensemble uh, that I've been directing now since 2018. And um, they have a, a great love of contemporary music. And we, in fact, have an album coming out uh, in May with commissions. The organization has been around for 30 years. And we've bringing out an album on Deutsche Grammophon which celebrates some of the music that's been written for us. Tan Dun wrote a double concerto, Mark Anthony Turnage as a Philip Glass piece, and Jake Heggie. So it's a, it's a, a mixture of, of music of today, and it's called Music for a New Century. So um, that's the other part of the work that I, I do um, in the Bay Area. And we're going on, in fact, on tour with the ensemble to Europe. So it's rather nice at the moment. We, ha we have the Europeans here, here and the American yeah. ensemble going to Europe. So, you know, it uh, keeps me busy. Spread the word. Yeah. Uh, we have one more work uh, today, a music of Edward Algar. What do you, what do you want us to know about this? Uh, this is Salut d'Amour, um, a greeting of love, um, perhaps one of his most famous pieces. It was written for his then fiance. Um, in order to, to try and win her hand, and it worked. And um, Alice Elgar said, whenever a, a woman hears this kind of melody, then she understands immediately. I'll leave it at that. Uh, well, then I think we should hear it then. Okay. Let's do it. Uh, let's finish our program today with the music by Edward Elgar, performed by violinist Daniel Hope and Maxime Lando, pianist, here on WQXR. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, great thanks to Daniel Hope. 
Maxine Landau. I want to thank the folks at Steinway for this beautiful piano. I want to thank the folks uh, here in the green space, WQXR, and our friends at 21C. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the radio.